Idiota Pesa for Florida, you judge. Thanks for tuning in. I am here with two wonderful gentlemen. I have Dario Diaz, who is an attorney here in the Tampa Bay area. Good afternoon, Dario. How are you? Good afternoon. And I also have a very, very good friend and colleague out of South Florida, Marcel Felipe, who is the founder of Inspire America Foundation. Hi, Marcel. How are you? And thank you so much for calling in and participating in this uh, segment. Oh. Thank you for having me, and, and thank you to all your listeners for, for tuning in. It's always very important to, to stay afloat of all these issues. Okay, and, and it's a hot topic now. The headlines are out there and questioning what our president, um, Donald Trump, is going to do in terms of the uh, policy instituted by former President Obama. I said, I just want you to introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your foundation, and I also want you to talk briefly about two popular activists that you regularly highlight, Dr. Oscar Vicet, and more recently, I know that um, Jorge Luis Antunes was honored uh, last month um, during the um, celebration of the independence of uh, Cuba, May 20th. Can you do that for the viewers? Yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, Inspire America Foundation uh, was formed that last year. We've been around for actually for less than a year. We've had a lot of impact for a short amount of time that we've been uh, involved, and we spent a lot on, on TV ads uh, on this issue. Um, a lot of uh, the work we do focuses on uh, supporting uh, Cuban opposition leaders, pro-democracy leaders, pro-Cuban leaders uh, inside Cuba, who do the, the work that's very, very similar to Martin Luther King did here in the United States in, in, in the 60s. Um, we work with them by supporting the work that they do inside Cuba and promoting their name outside of Cuba. We've been uh, to Hungary um, at the invitation of the Prime Minister. Um, we have uh, taken, uh, on some occasions, some of these uh, leaders to Washington, to the White House, to Senate, to, the co to meetings with the State Department. Um, we work with all of the major Cuban pro-democracy uh, groups but in particular with um, perhaps the three most popular um, and, and more famous, which is Dr. Bisset, uh, uh, Jorge Luis Perez, Antunes, and Antonio Rodiles. Antonio Rodiles, beginning backwards, um, left Cuba. Um, study was actually a professor here at, the, at FSU for a while, um, and then decided that he was going to return to Cuba and join the opposition and fight internally. So he's got a, a lot of merit and a very smart uh, uh, person. Antunes um, was very famous for his slogan, Ni se calla ni se va, I won't shut up and I'm not leaving. Um, Antunes spent 19 years in prison, endured tortures that most of his cellmates tried to kill them, themselves to avoid. Um, at every single point, he never uh, gave in because they constantly told him, you can leave. You can leave and cut your 18-year uh, sentence, because he actually did uh, some extra time, because they wanted him to ask for his release, and he said he wouldn't ask, because he didn't need to be held to begin with. And uh, many times he said, look, you could cut your sentence by simply saying that you're wrong and that, you know, Fidel is right. And, uh, and he refused. And so he's, he's very articulate, uh, very strong speaker, and, and always makes an impact everywhere he goes. And the third one is uh, perhaps the most internationally famous one, Dr. Oscar Elias Bisset. Uh, Dr. Bisset was a Nobel Peace Prize candidate. Um, he was also awarded the, US, the United States Presidential Medal of Freedom. An honor has been bestowed on people like Margaret Thatcher and Martin Luther King uh, in the past. Um, Dr. Bisset is also a favorite of uh, the popular band U2, Bono, dedicated his Miami concert to Dr. Bisset. Dr. Bisset is, I uh, would say, a modern-day Martin Luther King, as he is steadfast in his position of nonviolent uh, civic resistance. He's also very Christian. Um, he began his opposition work by opposing the Cuban government's um, mandated abortions practice. Um, and, um, and so he has also that, uh, that background. Um, those are the folks that we regularly work with and, and a lot of the type of work that, that we do. We've had events here in Miami uh, where we've had a thousand people come and, and see one of these leaders. Or last week we had one with, the, with Governor Scott. And um, 
uh, and uh, to, to honor Antunes. So that's a little bit of, what, of the work that we do and, and the people that we work with. Okay, and so I want to, I'm going to remain neutral here. I, and your position is, if, if I'm correct, I'm going to say is you want to continue on with the, the, the old hardline position with Cuba, right? Um, I wouldn't call it the old hardline position uh, on Cuba. I think there's, what we have to do is have a smart policies. And smart policies will include some elements of the positions that were in place uh, and that remain in place throughout the um, pre-Obama uh, era. Um, well, are some, we have is, to adopt some, some new measures. Let me ask you a uh, question. Well. Is there anything that that President, former President Obama did that is good, that you'd like to keep? Um, there's a few things that I would modify. Um, for example, you know, what he did with um, wet foot and dry foot. Um, even though I think he did it uh, for the wrong, in, the, in the wrong way, and I would do it a little bit differently, I do think that that is a step forward from the perspective of freedom for the Cuban people. Uh, in other words, you can look at this as the right to immigrate, um, and from that perspective is obviously a setback. But if you look at it from the perspective of helping Cuba gain its freedom, it's definitely um, a positive. Um, the Why is that a positive? It's a positive because the one of the things that has allowed the Castro regime to survive for so long has been this escape valve of immigration. Um, after the 1994 rebellion, there were thousands of people rebelled against the, the Castro regime. Um, the Castro regime was able to crack down and brutally put down that rebellion. And then immediately thereafter, what they did is they opened up the coast and said anyone that, that wants to leave can leave. And they do that, and they've done that regularly every time they really face a lot of internal pressure. Um, a lot of the folks leaving are younger people, um, uh, statistically, younger people that really do not fit into that system. They don't fit in that system, but rather than stay and work to change it, they basically decide to, to take the easier road of, of immigration. And, and I'm not saying that it's an easy road, but it's an easier road in trying to change a, a totalitarian system. Okay, that, and um, that, that effort would have been very, very well used in, in Cuba in uh, making changes. Uh, Dario, Diaz, tell me a little, or tell the viewers a little bit about yourself and um, respond to that point. Uh, I'm an attorney in Tampa, uh, first generation born in the United States, uh, family from Cuba. Uh, my history, my stories at home, my native language is Spanish. It's all a Cuban background. My father was in exile in 1961. My brother had to remain behind and spent time in prison in Cuba because of the very reason what we call an hijo de gusano, the son of a worm, uh, somebody who left the island and didn't participate in the revolution. Uh, that's my background personally. Um, there, as far as what I just heard right now, there's really not much that I, I can say I, I, I disagree with. Uh, I actually believe that the policy that has existed over 55 years and we've talked about these, uh, these individuals that have overcome the diversity, that are actually active in trying to, to change the human rights situation in Cuba. Uh, those are all incredible people that are doing incredible things. But let's not lose the fact that they've had to do those things over the 55 years that we've had this policy of Cuba, that we've had this policy of cutting them off. I started off my entire life and most of my adult life as what I would call a hardliner. We don't need to do anything with Cuba. We need to not deal with them. We need to get harder with them. We need to get more aggressive with them. And then I realized that the best predictor of the future is the past. And what we've done in the past, what we've done for 55 years, has gotten us what? These people that are scared to talk, has gotten us oppression, has gotten us nothing. The Cuban people suffer every single day. It's a horrible, horrible system. So when I looked at it and I thought to myself, what is America's greatest export? What, what should we be exporting everywhere? What's our greatest strength? And the answer to that question is democracy. And when we don't allow that to be exported, when we don't allow people to see us, when we don't share our music and our pop culture and the ideas of freedom with people, and we cut them off and just don't want to deal with them, what we get is what we've had for 55 years. And that's an oppressive government that doesn't even let people see what it is that we're about. And we're helping with it. 
And I just can't agree with that policy anymore. Dario, before I let Marcel respond to that, you made a point earlier when we were discussing this about who takes the blame for the conditions that you recently went to Cuba and you said that it's deplorable. It's, it's deplorable. And you said that who's the Cuban government blaming for that? Well, when you go around Cuba, you have everything in Cuba, by the way. Any Anything that's posted is always pro-Castro, pro-government, pro-revolution. Che Guevara is everywhere. So they have these billboards, and these billboards are the island of Cuba with a noose around it, with a comment that says, the embargo, the greatest genocide in the history of mankind. So what the government in Cuba has been able to do is create this straw man that the embargo is the reason for the Cuban suffering that the embargo is the reason that the Cubans are not able to move forward. They're not able to get ahead. They're not able to live a life like they see or they know exists outside because this embargo is stifling them. So remove that noose, remove that embargo, and you remove the chance for the government to keep using that embargo as the reason for the Cuban suffering. Cuban people are not stupid. They understand, but when they have something they can hang their hat on, when they have that nationalist, it's us versus them and their embargo, if you remove that, you take that away. You destroy that straw man. And I just think it's a better policy to say, you know what, let's do away with that embargo. Let's not give them that reason anymore. We've tried it for 55 years, and it's gotten everything worse. Marcel, respond. Okay. Um, those are a number of points there, so I'll try to, to take them one by one. And um, well, first, you know, the reason the Cuban regime has still survived isn't because people believe the government's propaganda about the embargo being the culprit, and therefore, according to that theory, they support the government because of it. The reason the, the regime is still there, it's because it's killed 100,000 people and imprisoned half a million. Plain and simple. There's no other reason. You don't have to be convinced of anything. You could be the most anti-Castro person, and when they've killed so many of your neighbors, you're not gonna, you're not gonna move. It's a state of terrorism against their own population. That's why they're there. Um, during the uh, World War II, the United States gave Europe uh, a significant amount of money on there, something called the Marshall Plan. The amount of money that the Soviet Union gave to Cuba was far higher than the United States gave to the reconstruction of Europe after World War II. And where did that money go? It didn't go, you know, there, there's no schools or hospitals or infrastructures that could be built with that money. That was, that was built without money. You don't see it in Cuba. Everything's the same building from the, the 50s. Um, much more money, by the way, and they would even be close to making by lifting the, the embargo. But the money went. When the government had that money, where did it use it? It went to guerrillas in Latin America that kidnapped children and used them as child soldiers. It went to send Cuban children to the jungles of Africa to die. Oh, Fidel could oh, say that he's a Napoleonic figure. But more importantly, it went to the creation of what one KGB general called the most repressive and sophisticated system uh, of totalitarianism he had ever seen, greater than the Soviet Union, a system that, like I said, has killed 100,000 Cubans, half a, it's imprisoned half a million Cubans. When you have that kind of system, it doesn't matter whether you have an embargo or not, the system is going to stay in place. Okay, Marcel, let him respond real quickly yeah. to that point before you go to your next point. Go. I, I will agree. It, it, he, he, there's absolutely correct. If you gave Castro 90, if you gave Castro a dollar, he would export 90 cents in revolution. I understand that. And he did all that with the embargo in place. He did all that with the United States trying to tighten the noose. He did all that with us not doing trade with him. And my point is, even though he's doing all that, even though he was able to export revolution, the embargo was in place during that time. Now we have a very different world. Russia is not exactly. the, Russia is not the USSR of 1961. Russia is not near the power that Russia that the USSR was during the Cold War. And we have a Cold War policy from 1961 that is dictating what we're doing in 2017 when the world has shifted and changed. We uh, you, you, the first part of what you said makes the argument for me. When the Cuban government had money uh, open flow from the Soviets, they did all those things with the embargo in place, right? But they did it with the embargo in place because they had the money from the Soviet Union. Once the money from the Soviet Union collapses, the Cuban government goes and turns into Venezuela. Okay, now, if you lift the embargo and you let theoretically all this money flow to Cuba, like we think incorrectly, 
and we assume that would happen, all that's going to happen is the Cuban government, which knows exactly that the strategy of the well-intentioned pro-engagement folks, because there's some bad intention, but the, the well-intentioned pro-engagement folks is we're going to export democracy and capitalism. First thing they're going to do, they're going to do exactly what they did in the 90s when they were forced to open up their markets. They're going to pick one or two country, or companies per industry, give them a monopoly, give them slave labor, which is what they do right now. Cuban workers could only get 8% of what the foreign uh, employer pays. The rest goes to the government. And the Cuban government is going to have the money to go ahead and do its repression and its terrorism and everything that's done every time it has money. It's done the same thing. Why are we going to assume that it's going to do anything different? It always does the same thing when it has money. When it doesn't have uh, when it doesn't have the money, it has to limit that activity. But either way, the money and that and that uh, openness doesn't get to the Cuban people because they know that if you get your way in that way, that they will lose control. So all you're going to do is give them more money to repress and give them more money for them to export anti-American sentiment. There is only one logical policy to do with a government like Cuba's, both from an ethical perspective and from a national security perspective on the U.S. side, and that is regime change. The only thing you can work with there is a brand new democracy where you can have a reliable partner. Um, right now, right now, there isn't a country like the Soviet Union was that could challenge the United States head-to-head. -head. That could change in a moment. And why are we going to worry about China, Russia, Iran? We're not going to worry about the potential base of operations 90 miles from our children. Okay, that let, is, let, doesn't make any sense. I said that Dario wants to respond real quick. Let, let me let me try to say what doesn't make any sense. What doesn't make any sense is that we have a system in place that you keep saying is repressive and you keep saying has done all these things and they've done every one of those things during this embargo. Every single one. There's been nothing that has been friendly at all. So when I look at it, I go, what can Cuba not get from Mexico? What can Cuba not get from Honduras? What can Cuba not get from Canada? Cuba can get whatever it wants from the rest of the world, but it can't do it because it doesn't have the money to do it. So what do they hang their hat on with the people of Cuba, the ones that do want to change? What do they hang their hat on? They hang their hat on this American embargo. They don't even call it an embargo. They call it a blockade. They, they, they present it to right. the people of Cuba. That it's well, a you're assuming that that's what's convincing the people of Cuba to keep to stay with their government, to not rebel, is the argument, as opposed to the boot on their head. So what better way, what better way than have something that says, you know what, we've done what we've done for 55 years. We've done it, and it hasn't worked exactly like we thought. So what do we change? What do we lose by saying, let's take that away. Let's remove that perceived quote-unquote noose that they are able to hang their hat on and let them see exactly what they hang their hat on then. Because you're not going to have USSR, you're not going to have the Soviet Union rush in and give them $75 billion. It doesn't work like that. That was then. That was in 1960. This is 2017. Russia does not have near the power of the assets to do what the USSR did. War policy is based on 1961 politics, and it failed. It's not working correctly. Okay, I'm going to let Marcel respond, and then I'm going to ask you, Marcel, what is exactly would you want, if anything, for Donald Trump to reverse okay. as far as the, um, as the new policy? Yeah, first, let me respond. Okay. Because, you know, you keep saying I'm stuck in 1961, and you keep going back to the Cold War in 1961. It seems... You're the only one stuck in 1961. I'm not talking about 1960. I'm, well, no, I'm saying, listen, you had your turn. Let me respond. Well, 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 hold on. When you mis no, no. Listen, I'm going to Let my said respond, right. and then I'll get, let right. you respond. The, you go back to saying Russia doesn't have the money to pay. Precisely. The reason they were able to do all of these things in the face of the embargo was because they had Russia giving them money, something they don't have now, and they're not going to have once Venezuela falls. But besides that, your policy is all centered, or your discussion and strategy is all centered around the embargo. My perspective, when we started, was I'm not stuck on any one policy. I'm stuck on getting freedom to that island. To get freedom to that island, I believe the embargo is one component. Why? Because if you lift, the embargo by itself is not going to produce freedom. But if you lift it, and I don't agree that the embargo is a justification that causes 
the regime to stay in power. What causes the regime to stay in power, once again, is the fact that the regime kills everyone that's opposed to it. And that has, tends to have a chilling effect, with or without the embargo. Without the embargo, they'll be able to do that more. So the embargo is a factor that is good to have because it helps. Uh, having it or not having it is not going to determine the freedom of Cuba. Okay, my it's going to determine the freedom of Cuba and the policies that need to take place to be able to determine the freedom of Cuba is A, greater assistance to the Cuban opposition, B, a greater role for radio and TV Martin in ways that radio and TV Martin has been so neglected. It can and should be the most sophisticated and best tool that we have to use to bring about democracy in Cuba. But we, we've ignored it for a very long time. Listen, I said I follow your argument, but just I need clarification on that. You raised a good point. Russia is no longer there and it can't help Cuba. But what about Canada, Mexico, Honduras, the other countries that he said that would help them? They, they wouldn't help them. They trade with them. The Cuba doesn't need trade. Cuba needs to be maintained because a communist system doesn't produce anything, doesn't have any way of sustaining itself. It, it ends when it ends, uh, it runs out of other people's money. And the only one that's, the only reason that Castro is still there now is because after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they were able to hang on, on Hugo Chavez and suck money out of Venezuela and join it with Hugo Chavez, rape Venezuela of all its money. Um, now that Venezuela is on the verge of breaking down, and if uh, uh, we also stop the American uh, gift-giving that, that the Castro's are trying to set up with, uh, with the Obama policies, because, by the way, well, this is where they're going and where they want to end up is American financing of Cuban purchases, which then Cuba neglects on and the American taxpayer pays for. That's the end game. That's what they've pushed for all along, because Cuba doesn't have the money to buy any of it. All they have is the, is the ability to finance it. Um, by the way, they never pay on their on any of their loans, and so you go back to the to this to the same issue. We're at a crucial point. The government of Cuba is about to run out of money. When it runs out of money, since it cannot operate, what it invariably does, as it did in the '90s, is it opens up the free markets. It knows that free markets. It knows your theory that you're that you're putting forth. It knows that the free markets are a threat to it. So that's why whenever they do have money, whenever they do have trade, they close down free markets and you got to deal exclusively with the government and the, and the military-owned enterprises. But when they feel starved, that's when they open the free markets. And that's when change, real change begins to happen. That's why as soon as they got the Chavez money, they closed back down all the free markets and they started again with the government monopolies. They know this game that that the pro-engagement, the well-intentioned pro-engagement pro folks want to play. They know that game better than anyone. They're not going to fall for it ever. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that you therefore go de facto back to a policy that's put an embargo and forget about it and see if, if they stuff to death. That's never been my policy. You have to have that as a piece of the puzzle to negotiate with a, for a good transition with whoever comes, um, whoever comes next. But that strategy includes strengthening of the Cuban opposition, strengthening of radio and TV Marti, because there's no reason technologically today why radio and TV Marti can be seen everywhere on the island, and a good and direct um, process to identify elements within the government that can be part of the change. Okay, Dario, do your turn. That your way turn. that you affect the change. Do you know, do you, do you, uh, really, speaking technologically, do you know how easy it is to jam a signal? You could have Radio Marti beaming whatever you want to beam, and it's going to get jammed. It's not going to get jammed, I tell you. I own a television station. I know a lot about this. Satellite signals from uh, to Cuba are possible. We, the, the Cuban government can do absolutely nothing about it. Nothing that the Cuban government can do about it. It can protest that's internationally, it can do, but it, other than that, it cannot that physically sounds, interfere. That the, the only reason we don't do that right now is because politically, we haven't wanted to do so. Right. That sounds great, but I know that not to be accurate. I know okay. that there is no way you can get a signal in somewhere and not have it jammed. There is no unjammable signal ever to exist on the planet. So if, that, if that's your position, that's just okay. Uh, listen, maybe you're smarter than, than all the engineers that we've consulted, but maybe you know more. But it's, it's, it's you, it, it may be, it may be, I'll, I'll give you this, it may be that there's some way that they can block a satellite signal, but it would, would not be any way that is cost, it's all, all the ways that could exist would be cost prohibitive 
to the Cuban government. The Cuban government right now, from satellite signals, from what the, my engineers tell me, and, and perhaps, Haiti, this is something I would very much love for you to go to a third party and get sort of a, you know, we're all lawyers, get your expert opinion, because we've consulted with experts, specifically on TV satellite signals, and they've told us we can do this. Okay, listen, what exactly, okay. if any, you want to respond to that, yeah, Dario? Actually, I do. Number one, the, the mischaracterization that somehow I think you're stuck in the 1960s is incorrect. It's a 1960s policy. This has existed since 1961. So whether, you, whether you're saying that I'm stuck in the 60s or I think you're stuck in the 60s matters not. The fact is it's a 1960s policy when the world was a very different world. And when you say, okay, well, in 1980 we had the safety valve. And the, guess what? The, the, the last law was 1996. And then on top of that, we had the Soviet Union fall. Oh, but then they did this. And then we had this. And then we had that. Well, we're always going to have that happening. So what? when it doesn't work again, look, there's a saying, the only form of government you can't impose is democracy. You can't impose it. Yet it seems that somehow you want to impose it. You want to say we're going to make it harder for you because then you're going to be a Democrat or you're going to be a democracy. We're going to make it worse for you because that's going to make you turn to democracy. We're going to really, we're going to really cut it off now. And nobody's going to come in and save you. And that's going to make a democracy. You can't impose that. And there comes a time where you say, you know, we need to straighten out Radio Marti. Well, how long is Radio Marti? I was just there. I went out of my way, actively seeking the signal. Nobody can get the signal. Nobody. And I know that you have engineers and I know you have guy, but in the ring. No, the, the, and the reason you can't get it is because the current direction of Radio and TV Marti under Barack Obama didn't want you, anyone in Cuba, to get it. Hold on. They specifically are, are trying to destroy Radio and TV Marti. Okay, what were you going to say as a former Marine, okay. Dario? As, as a former Marine, I, I, I have a little bit, because I was in intelligence, I have a little bit about jamming. I have a little bit about a knowledge about it. I, I think a little bit more than a little about military-grade encryption. There is no signal on the planet, and you can tell your engineers and tell them, it, it, I am, I'm easy, I'm on the Internet, I'm easy to find. Tell your engineers that if they have a signal that can't be jammed, we need to take that to North Korea. We need to take that to every place in the world. Because if you have, now, if you have super high-tech encryption equipment that you're planning on giving everybody in Cuba so that they can get a military-grade encryption RSA signal to decrypt it and put it on their screen after it's been wrapped in an envelope wrapper with SSL and beamed through a satellite to a seal phone, then yeah. It's a little bit unrealistic to think that's how it's going to happen. The fact of life is you're not going to get a signal to a television set in Cuba. It's not going to happen. So when you tell people, give money to Radio Marti, we can do this, you're deceiving them. You know, oh, we can do it with the money that already, that's already there. But look, I'm not going to argue with a lawyer about whether it's engineerly feasible to get it there. I can go by what engineers have told me. And like I said, I think that debate, the best way to settle it is simply have experts come in and discuss that on, on the program. I'd be glad to. Okay, very well. But that's not the central point that we were trying to right. get to in this segment. The one is... What, if anything, do you want reversed from the policy that Obama instituted? I would want everything uh, reversed, except for the wet foot, dry foot. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of things that I would simply want modified. Um, the, one of the things that he allowed was to provide Internet services to the islands. I would have that modified because I do think it's a good to have Internet services on the island, but modified so that none of those services or equipment can include anything that can be used for censorship. Um, so none of the filters and none of the stuff, because that's really the model that the regime is beginning to move away from, or towards, rather, is slowly increasing Internet accessibility as they manage to control the content that you can access. Slowly. They're not there yet, but that's their goal. What, what, what do you respond to uh, in, uh, with the arguments that it's a double standard because we trade with China and with other countries that don't recognize human rights? Uh, I, I say that, yes, that I, that I agree. That I agree very, very much. And from the human rights perspective, we shouldn't be trading with China. We shouldn't be trading with the other countries. Having said that, Cuba is in China. Uh, when it comes to human rights, Cuba is in China, Cuba is in Vietnam, Cuba is North Korea. Um, that's the level of the issues in, in Cuba. Uh, and, but yes, I do believe now every, every policy has more than one consideration. And in the case of China, there's also these 
uh, economic considerations. I don't think that economics should trouble our human rights policy. Um, I think it makes us weaker as a country. But, you know, I, I haven't won that argument. Okay, so national security-wise, it should be the same. Cuba it should be our number one national security concern because Cuba is not 90 miles from our borders. And any enemy that we have at any given time can use that as a springboard to the United States. What do you, that, that, that's, that's a, that, that, it, it, there, there's, yeah, that's not, Cuba is definitely not a threat to the United States of America. Great, and you're a graduate of the Annabelle and Montes School of National Security. Let me explain. Annabelle and Montes was someone that was the head intelligence officer, analyst at the Defense Intelligence Agency that for many, many years uh, taught our military and taught our policymakers about whether or not Cuba was a threat, the, the foremost expert on it. Turns out that she was arrested right after 9-11 because she was working for Cuban intelligence, and her mission was to get this idea into American military establishment that Cuba was not a threat. And unfortunately, she educated so many folks and so many analysts that are then parroting her ideas. However, when you pick up any book dealing with international relations or geopolitics, and the first day of class, first thing they taught me was, if you're a superpower, you cannot have, forget about an enemy, you can't have any unreliable government near your border. And the United States have forgotten that rule in part because of the damage done by Adam and Montes, and I hope she continues to rot in jail for the work that she did for a tyrannical regime. Okay, I said, so other than the internet service being uh, available in, on the island, what other uh, benefit do you think we have from the, the policy that Obama instituted? Um, none, I think the, 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 the Obama, the failed Obama policy, they had it for eight years and then intensified it for the last four, produced nothing, and in fact, that general concept of we liberate and the economy and it brings out political change is not only did it fail in Cuba over the last eight years, it's failed everywhere it's been tried. Hitler did not have a, a close society. He had free economy and he had a dictatorship. What about China the, today has the same thing. What about the, Cuban, dictatorship. what about the Cubans in Hialeah and Miami and all around the country that send things to their family members in Cuba? Should they stop? <laughs> There's two other things other than the Internet that we would not uh, leave but modify, and that is remittances and uh, travel from Cuban Americans. And those should be modified, not eliminated, um, so that anyone that is not just a member of the Communist Party, but anyone that is part of the repressive apparatus of the regime, meaning the people that go out and beat up women coming out of church, like they do every single Sunday to the ladies in white, those folks should not be entitled to get any U.S. visas or any U.S. remittances, but leave the, the remittances and, and, and the travel for other um, non-affiliated um, Cuban, Cuban nationals. Because, again, it goes back to what I think the central policy should be. It's not the embargo. Everyone loves to talk about the embargo. It's the assistance to creating that independent society, the assistance to the opposition groups, the family-to-family -family direct assistance that doesn't go through the government. Um, but excluding the people that are um, tied to the government. And the perfect example is I have two uncles. One's always been against the government, one that's always been with the government. The, the one that's always been with the government has been able to come to the United States repeatedly, over a dozen times. He gets visas because they know that he'll go back. That guy was recently approached to go and beat up the ladies in white as they were coming out of church. And he said, no, I'm not going. And he told me the story, and I thought that you know, perhaps he had had really a good... Uh, ideological change. And he said, no, 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 I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to get in trouble. Said, what do you mean trouble? You got in trouble for not going. It's like, if I go, forget about the trouble here. If I go and someone takes a picture of me, then I won't get a visa. And really, it comes down to all of these guys that beat up women, their most cherished possession is an American visa. We need to use that to be able to start uh, modifying behavior on the island. Again, it's not about the embargo. People stuck on the embargo. I, I, I think we should keep the embargo. But people stuck in the embargo argument and giving it that much importance um, lose sight of the main thing, of the main fight going on in the streets of Havana every single day where their dissidents are gaining more and more freedom for the population directly and literally on the, on the sticks that are very, being broken on their backs. Okay, so let's, let's, let's take a, and I'll analyze that for a second. And I let you speak, so I, I hope you don't all give me the same courtesy. 
So we want to turn back, according to you, the eight-year failed Obama policy. E eight years, and, and, and we'll, it's not eight years, but that's okay. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and say that it is eight years. And you call it a failed Obama policy. And return to the 47 year before that policy that worked so well for us. That's what we want. So what we're saying is the last eight years haven't worked. It really, you know, that's, that's not. The 47 years before that, man, that was the golden age. Well, of course not. That's not the way this works. So we have a system where, where we've implemented this for, for 55 years, three generations. Three generations, the same United States policy has been in place. And at the end of the day, what do we get? The same ladies in white being beat. The same group of people that are violating human rights. The same situation we have. When you talk about uh, somebody being a traitor like Anna Boleyn, if there was a traitor from Canada, we would put that person in jail. If there was a traitor from Mexico, we would put that person in jail. I framed it as Cuba is not a military threat to the United States of America. So they have no Navy that's going to come bomb us. They have no army that's going to come invade us. So we can control that situation militarily if we have to, but we don't have to. What we need to do is take a look at a way that we're going to actually say the 47 years before Obama, and I'm giving you every credit that that failed policy started eight years ago. The 47 years before didn't work either. So what do we look to do? Not more of the same. I mean, that's got to be the way that we look at things. Do I want to tell you that human rights um, don't matter? Of course not. Felix Varela, these people are people that are people of strength that go out of their way to make things right. And does Castro, or does the Castro regime and the communist regime kill people? Absolutely. Does it imprison people? Absolutely. But it does that in spite of the embargo that's been in place the entire time. So there comes a time where we have to say, doing the same thing over and over again and it's not working becomes lunacy. Expecting a different result from the same policy is foolish. And that's what we keep doing. We keep on saying we're going to impose democracy. You cannot impose democracy. That has to come from within. So what can we do? we can remove that noose that they keep saying is the strangling hold and take that out of their hands. That doesn't mean let them do whatever they want. That doesn't mean let people violate their human rights. We keep supporting that. We keep on supporting people like Felix Varela. We keep on supporting people that are in Cuba fighting for what is right. We don't give that up and just say we're not going to help you anymore. But what it says is we're going to remove that barrier that lets the government keep telling you that's what's oppressing you. It's that that's doing that. Any last words, Marced? The, the, the last words that I could say uh, in closing is this concept of when we've done something over and over, and we've had police, and we've funded police for over 100 years, and crime still exists. Does that mean we shouldn't have police anymore? No. Um, despite the fact that the Cuban government continues to do this. We have made progress in one thing. Your eight years and my 47 years, or whatever you want to call it, have both failed. Have both failed because the regime is still there, right? So you need to come up with new ideas. And new ideas doesn't mean discarding all of the old ideas just because they were there before. It means you look at it, you start fresh. I wasn't involved in formulating the old policy, and certainly not the Obama policy. All I can do is look at it now and say, what parts of what policy? You know, I'm not here to criticize Obama just because he's Obama. I've told you, you asked me, what are parts that you would like? I've told you, there's not many, there's a couple. What are the parts of the old one? I've told you. And what is the new one? And I've told you that as well. So I'm not hung up on this thing of Republican and Democrat, or Obama or before Obama. Let's look at it from the beginning and not let, let's not discard something just because it hasn't produced the result that you've wanted. Maybe you need more in the mix. And I think that you, we both uh, and everyone looking at this debate has to keep that open mind. And unfortunately, I think the folks that support the Obama policy have a very, very close mind. They believe that anything that came before was bad and that they have all of the solutions, even though there's no empirical evidence to support. Okay, Dario, if you want to make a last statement, you can. And thank you, Marcel, for participating in this segment. This is very important. Thank you as well, Dario. If you want to finish off, you, you could. Sure. And, and in deference to what was, what was just said, you know, we can, we can actually say 
eight years versus 47 or whatever, and one didn't work, yet we gave one six times more to work than the other one. And I don't think it's as simple as saying that we need to, we need to do more to impose the democracy. We need to tighten up even more. That's very simplistic as well. The reality of life is, is that we have had a certain policy in place that is so dated and needs to be revised and needs to be looked at in a very critical way. And the critical way has to be such that we actually get a chance to interact with our policies and our people and the way that we are in this country and the freedom that we value and get that across because that's simply not happening right now. And the embargo prevents that from happening even more.